I want to thank you all for being here today. My job is a, is a minimal job. I have to chair the events. The speakers who follow will give you a detailed account of how the murder of Pat and the attempted assassination of Geraldine affected them. But let me say on record, I want to thank the Finucane family for allowing me to be part of today's events. It's very important for me. There are so many people in the hall to acknowledge. I'm not going to acknowledge very many. But I have to say that there are people who have travelled some considerable distance to be with us today. There is a delegation somewhere here, somewhere on the border, from the American Hibernians, uh, the Ancient Order of Hibernians, and the Ladies' Ancient Order of Hibernians. So could we welcome their representation who are here today. <laughs> on a personal level, I have to say that many of us will have our own views and our, 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 our explanations as to why Pat Funukin lost his life. But not least of all, and shared by us all, is the, the need for, for the state and state forces to both silence Pat and send a message to those who would follow in his footsteps that uh, this will not be tolerated. I had the privilege last week of being in Brussels as part of a lobby around the, the whole issue of legacy and the Time for Truth campaign. I was there with Pat's brother, Seamus. If the idea was that Pat Finucane's memory, or indeed what inspired Pat, would be lost, I can tell you that the opposite is still the effect. Not only for those who listen to Seamus talk about Pat and the, the passion that drove him, that search for justice, but by the young solicitors and lawyers who were part of the delegation with us. And talking to them, it's quite clear that their aspiration and their inspiration was, was Pat. So, from that point of view, whatever the state hoped to achieve, it has failed. I want to acknowledge also Peter Madden's in the room somewhere. I, I caught him, caught it in my eye earlier on, and that was very much a double act. So, for all of those, and, and I also want to acknowledge the relatives uh, who are here tonight, today, not only from Belfast but from across. So, from all of us to all of you, Scarry Mila Mayagat, I'm going to call our first speaker, and no better explanation and no better inspiration than and view of, of the man, the father, the husband, than, than John. So if John would come up and give us a few words. John. Um, thank you very much to everyone here today, and you're all very welcome. Um, it's very humbling on behalf of the family to see so many people here today, so many people here today who have stood beside us for 30 years. And when you say 30 years, um, I was asked by um, UTV before coming into the room today that, you know, 30 years, how do you feel? And it's such a surreal question to find yourself standing there having to answer because 30 years is such a big number, such a huge number, but yet you live it and in the blink of an eye, here we are today. And the fact that so many people are here today, and I know there's lots of people who want to be here today and have sent us messages of support, it really is a continued source of inspiration and strength for our family that everybody comes here today. So it would be remiss of me not to start off by thanking everybody here today and, and for Fela and St Mary's for hosting this event. My father was Pat Finucan. I'm the youngest son of Pat, and Pat came, Pat was born a stone's throw away from where we are today. He was one of eight children, born into poverty in, in the Falls Road, and like anybody at that time, got on with things, played football, went to school, and he benefited, really, after going to St Mary's on the Glen Road, he benefited from third level education that was opened up to a generation that had been prevented from going to third level education before and he went to Trinity and he was I guess very lucky to go to Trinity at a time when Belfast exploded and the north exploded and many people's lives took a different turn forever and it was at Trinity that he met my mother Geraldine uh, nice middle class respectable Protestant from East Belfast meeting 
from what I hear, a rogue from Falls Road, West Belfast. And I think my mother can only be described as nothing other than a groupie to the soccer team. Um, and it was there that she met, she, she met my father. And they fell hopelessly in love and got married at university. And after university, they set up home in Lenadon in the early 70s, which I think most people need no explanation that that was a very, uh, a, a very turbulent time in our local history. And it was a very busy time for, for my mother and my father. And it was at that time that I think that having come from this community, um, having been, I suppose, blessed with the education that Trinity provided to him, it was at that point that he felt that he wanted to give something back, that he wanted to use his education um, to fight and champion for the rights of people within his community because it didn't really take too much of a persevering eyesight to really see that the people in this community were being denied rights, were being oppressed, were victims of a state regime and policy that was very much one-sided and designed to do one thing only, and that was keep a community in their place without any questions being asked. And in 1979, as Joe said, uh, with his partner Peter Madden, he, he set up the firm Madden and Finucane. And I'm, I'm a solicitor myself now, and whilst I've been a solicitor for some time, uh, my older brother Michael has been a solicitor for much longer, and I see other solicitors in the room as well, I think the context and the atmosphere in which he practiced in in the 80s is something that I will probably never truly understand as much as I read about it. And I think that's a very good thing, because no solicitor should have to work in the environment that, that, he, that he worked in professionally. A lot of the cases that he was involved in, a lot of the, um, I suppose, very unique way of approaching cases and the ingenious way of holding the state to account are, are very much taken for granted, I think, by lawyers today. Um, having police officers come and give evidence, having army personnel come and give evidence whenever they shot somebody in very disputed circumstances. We take that now as a right that should be there uh, and should never be undermined. But it was in the 80s, in the midst of people being killed on a, on a much more regular basis than they are today, that people like my father, um, really, people like my father, you could probably count on, on one hand, um, who did that work in that environment. And I think it was that success that ultimately brought him to the attention of the police, of the army, of the security services, and ultimately the government. He worked in holding centres, Castle Ray, Gough, um, places that we're all familiar with and have a reputation. And it was in those, it was in that experience with his clients that he started to hear threats. And clients would come to him and say, Jeez, Pat, they didn't even ask me anything about what they arrested me for. They were talking about you. You're a thug in a suit. I need to get myself a new solicitor. You're not going to be around for very much longer. And whilst that obviously unnerved my father to a certain extent, I think it was uh, perhaps dismissed, understandably, as an interrogation technique by the police designed to undermine and um, unnerve the client. But that changed, and changed utterly, when just a number of weeks before my father was murdered, um, a government minister, Douglas Hogg, out of context, stood up in the House of Commons and really put my father very much in the crosshairs and set the public um, reaction for what would come uh, a, a number of weeks later when he said that there were a number of solicitors who were unduly sympathetic to the IRA. And having spoken with my mother, or having spoken with my mother since, that really did change um, how my father looked at things and certainly how my mother looked at things. But there was no time to react uh, because in a matter of weeks later, about two weeks later, we were sitting down for Sunday dinner on the 12th of February 1989. Um, I was just a couple of weeks before my ninth birthday, so we were sitting having dinner when we heard uh, a sound. And two gunmen came in and shot my father 14 times and, and my mother once. And our lives changed forever fr from that point. Um, I, I've been asked a number of times over the years, you know, how do you cope or what are your memories or, you know, how, how do you deal with something like that? And I think it's, it, it, it's a difficult question to ask because I think anybody who loses somebody in, in any circumstance, it's, it's a very 
personal reaction, and there's no one reaction that fits all people. Um, and personally, I think I lost a, a couple of years, so it's difficult to remember everything that followed for a couple of years after that. But whilst the events of that night will never be forgotten and will never leave, I think what, what happened to us as a family is that because of my father's work, because of the threat, the threats that had been made, and because I think the community knew, because it, it wasn't the first time that this had happened, um, it was just maybe a high-profile incident where it had been happening for years, that we just began asking questions. And whilst people say, you know, how have you had a campaign for 30 years, there's no science to it. Because under the direction and I suppose the, the um, unknown leadership, perhaps, of my mother, we just began by asking questions and by getting the support because we wouldn't have, we wouldn't, certainly wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the support that we had. And we began asking questions. Um, we asked why was he threatened? Why did Douglas Hogg make those statements? And from there, more questions were naturally there to be asked. And really, a couple of years later, again, we found out that there was an agent by the name of Brian Nelson, um, a loyalist who had been recruited, brought from Germany, back into the UDA, designed to refine and professionalise the UDA's intelligence, um, was sent to South Africa to bring weapons in. Um, I met a couple of people from the Lock and Island campaign before coming in today, and the weapons from South Africa were used there. They were used right across the north and beyond, and they resulted in the deaths of hundreds and hundreds of people. And they were weapons brought in under the supervision of the British government by Brian Nelson. And all of this was really bursting to come out, and it just started off by a family asking questions. And we really benefited from the support of non-governmental organisations. We had the support of some very brave lawyers in America, in London, and in Ireland, who got together and asked questions. We had the support of non-governmental organisations. Um, we then had the support of political parties, and we then had the support of the Irish government. And, and that support, I'm pleased to say, continues today. The family will be meeting with the Taoiseach Leo Varadkar tomorrow, who, who will again confirm his government's support for our family and our campaign for truth and for justice. And again, before you know it, you're five years, you're ten years into a campaign. And I say campaign, I probably shouldn't call it that, it's just life. It, it, it's dealing with life without your father and it's asking questions because for a long time you don't necessarily have things to do, it's not always meetings. Um, but one thing that I always like to stress is that whilst there are so many people in this room today and when you, I can travel around the world and the name, you say your surname Finucan and people go, are you anything to Pat Finucan? and they know immediately what that name represents. But it wasn't always like that. Maybe not for the people in this room, but certainly with the surname Finucane. I can only imagine what it was like for my mother to go and do the shopping and perhaps hand over a card or a checkbook and people would see the name Finucane and would look and would make their own views or would make their own mind up about who exactly she was and what she represented because it wasn't necessarily easy to say that there was such a thing as collusion that happened and resulted in the murder of my father. We were attacked very deliberately, very cruelly, as nothing more than Republican propagandists, that my mother was nothing more than an IRA man's widow, and that we were nothing more than IRA, an IRA man's children who didn't deserve any truth and certainly didn't deserve any justice. So as somebody who is older now and has children, I think raising children, all four of my children are here today, so I make no bones about saying these are very hard work. Um, <laughs> to, to do that in, in any context I think is difficult. To do that having lost your husband is unimaginable. To do that with a media, with a, a wider population who see you as somebody who is nothing more than a troublemaker. I, I, I just can't understand what that, what that would have been like. Um, but nonetheless, every morning we were up and ready for school. We had our lunches. I was brought to football. Um, and, and life went on. And I think it's only really as I get older that I truly appreciate um, 
the hard work, the strength, the resilience that, that my mother would have had to make sure that life did go on and that we were affected as little as possible beyond what was absolutely necessary. And I think that's something that, that, is, that, that deserves and needs to be recognised today. Um, thank you. And our, our, our campaign developed and it was something that attracted a lot of attention and we had police investigations from Britain's most senior policeman, John Stevens, now Lord Stevens, who came here three times, who had his offices burnt down in mysterious circumstances, um, and who reported that there was collusion. No shock to my family, no shock to the people in this room, but it sent shockwaves out around the world that there was collusion in the murder of a lawyer. A lawyer that operated in the United Kingdom courts killed by the United Kingdom government. And that led to more questions and it led to more of a, a, more of a momentum in our campaign. And then we, I sometimes find that in our campaign it's been parallel to the peace process at times when there's been progress in the peace process. We sometimes find that we are the beneficiaries of that um, inadvertently. And at one such period, uh, at Western Park, there was a mechanism put in place whereby a judge of international standing would look at six controversial cases. And if he recommended there should be an inquiry, the relevant government would have an inquiry. Very crudely, there was three from one side and three from another side that were uh, put together. And of the, five of, of the six cases, he recommended an inquiry into five of them. Of the five of them, four of them applied to the British government and one of them applied to the Irish government. Uh, the Irish government set up the Smithwick Tribunal at a time when the country was about to go bankrupt, but they honoured their commitment and their obligation. The British government set up inquiries into the murder of Billy Wright, Robert Hamill, Rosemary Nelson, and those inquiries have commenced, they've reported, they've concluded. And we then went, I think possibly for one of the first times to Downing Street to be told that whilst there was, in fact, very quickly before we get to Downing Street, I just, I, I remember, the actual decision by Judge Corey as to whether there would be an inquiry or not, simply yes or no, that whether he recommended an inquiry, the British government refused to tell us whether it was yes or whether it was no. And we had to threaten through Peter Madden to judicially review, to challenge them, to, to simply tell us what the judge had said. And in an act of extraordinary compassion, and, and Judge Corey was very much an extraordinary man, he's a very interesting life, he picked up the phone to our family and said it was shameful. Um, that whilst he couldn't tell us what was in the report, he felt obligated on a human level to tell us that he had recommended an inquiry. And I think that in itself gives an insight as to, as to what we have dealt with along with many other families uh, over the years. And when the British government say that they are a neutral party in the North, that they are committed to truth in the past and reconciliation, I think little instances like that always come to my mind because when it comes to actual actions and deeds, for me, for my family, they are usually found wanting. Um, but Judge Corey recommended an inquiry and Tony Blair sat us down, asked us to trust him, told us that the law had to be changed to deal with inquiries, the law of the land, it was archaic, the Bloody Sunday inquiry was set up under archaic legislation, it needed, needed tidied up. And whilst that on the face of it maybe sounded okay, very crucially what they did was they fundamentally changed and shifted the balance of power within a tribunal. We're realistic. We know that in any court process, you're not going to win every single battle, but you have to have faith in the tribunal itself. You have to have a belief that it is capable of getting to the truth. And what they did under their new powers was give the power to the minister. So if we were in a scenario where the judge would say, well, we think the Finucane family should see these documents. If the minister said, no, 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 definitely not, they're much too sensitive, then the minister's word would win over. Um, and it was for that reason we were unable to enter into an inquiry under those circumstances because it would simply be incapable of getting to the truth and I think would denigrate everything that my father stood for. And so what followed was an impasse for, for a couple of years. And then we found ourselves with a new Secretary of State under the Conservative Liberal Democrat coalition. Owen Patterson called us in, I think it was myself and my mother, were at the first meeting, said all the right things. This wasn't under his government's watch. It's been a 
heavy chain around the government's neck for so long, they want to get to the bottom of it, they want to engage with us. And for around nine months, behind or away from the cameras and, and the media, we engaged with our lawyers and we felt we came up with a mechanism and a proposal that would be capable of having that integrity that would allow us to participate uh, and would be capable of finally getting to the truth. And we were brought over to Downing Street. And again, um, I think, just to give you an insight again, anecdotally, going into that meeting, all the journalists were saying, oh, you're going over to get your inquiry, aren't you? And we said, well, we don't know. And nobody believed us. They all, knew, they all thought and were convinced that we were going over. We knew we were getting an inquiry announced and we just weren't allowed to say. I think days before the meeting, one of the senior Downing Street advisors spoke with Peter Madden and Peter, in his usual not so subtle way, was trying to find out exactly what was going to go on in, in the meeting. And the advisor said, trust me, the family will not be disappointed with what the Prime Minister is going to tell them. And so we went to Downing Street and again the meeting started off very well, this time with David Cameron. He was a young man, wasn't in politics in 89 had nothing to do with his government, he wanted to get to the bottom of it and that's why he wants a barrister to look at the papers and have a review and that's when the meeting went very sour very quickly and he was challenged on that and I suppose you can forgive my pettiness that it would always be one of my prouder moments to have watched my mother kick David Cameron out of a room in his own house. Such, such was the feeling of the meeting in uh, And actually, I see Mum laughing. We were we were in America about a year or two after that, and there was a we were at a, a breakfast thing, and there was my mum was getting some coffee, and there was a tall guy who said, "Oh, you maybe don't remember me. I was in that infamous meeting." And uh, my mum said, oh, "Infamous, really?" And she said, "Oh, oh yes, yes." And says, "Would well, you think the prime minister would remember me?" "Oh, yes, the prime minister would definitely remember you, Mrs. Funicut." So, and I think anybody who meets my mother will probably say the same thing. But the um, it, it, it was very, I think my, my brother described it as cruel, I, I think that's correct, um, to have brought us over, to give us something that was even less than what had went before. Um, and for obvious reasons we, we, couldn't, we couldn't take part in a process that wasn't transparent, that wasn't public, that we had no input into. Um, and the barrister, who was very much somebody very friendly and had strong links with the Conservative Party, um, then submitted his report um, a, a year or two later, and that's the De Silva report. And whilst the De Silva report is there rightly to be attacked with regard to its methodology and you know the real reason behind why um, what, why it was put there for our family, I think it is important. It's an important document that needs to be read. It confirms a lot of what we already knew. It gives us some more information. And not surprisingly, De Silva will say that he saw more papers than Corey, but he has seen everything. Which is funny because when Corey looked at everything, he said, well, he's actually seen more than Stevens, but he has definitely seen anything or everything. Uh, so there's a pattern there. And the De Silva report was published to much fanfare and it resulted in the Prime Minister David Cameron apologising to our family privately and apologising to us in front of the world publicly in, in the House of Commons. And whilst there is a lot to criticise. I think the apology is very important because whenever we go back to the 80s or the early 90s when there was no such thing as collusion or maybe there was a few rotten apples in a very large barrel of otherwise very healthy and proud apples, um, we now have the stage where the British Prime Minister has had to stand up in his sovereign parliament and apologise for the murder of Pat Finucane and that is something that I think will always follow them uh, and will always be there for them to deal with whenever they say that they are here as champions of human rights and that they are serious about dealing with the past. And I was asked at the time how, how I felt about the apology and again it's, it, it's slightly strange because for me the, the case of Pat Finucane really is, is about accountability. It, it's about holding those in power to account whenever things go wrong, and nothing I think can be more serious of going wrong than 
the murder of its own citizens. And for that to happen, true accountability for me, we need to have a complete examination in as tra transparent a, a fashion as possible of all of the facts, no matter how painful they are. That needs to be recognised, it needs to be accepted, and then lessons must be learned to make sure that that never happens again. Because it continues, the case of Pat Finuc and I feel continues to cast a very long and dark shadow right into the present. It, it impacts on our confidence in policing, in government, in the security services, in the intelligence services, because they have failed abysmally to deal with this. And at, at that end of the process, I think that is when an apology comes, if necessary, and that's when it has most weight. I don't think I could be um, criticised for seeing the apology as a somewhat of a cynical exercise. I've described it before as coming up to one of you and saying, oh, I'm very, very sorry, I've done a really bad thing on you. The first thing you'd ask is, well, what did you do? I said, oh, I can't tell you, but it's bad. But believe me, I'm very, very sorry. And whilst that might be a slightly trivial way, trivial way of um, explaining the apology as to how I feel about it, I think that really is at the heart of it. And it was designed to, it was designed to, I think, frustrate and slow down our calls for an inquiry. And, and where we are, um, where we are with the inquiry, we were in the Supreme Court last year. We have formally and judicially challenged the government's failure to give us an inquiry and we had a hearing before the Supreme Court last year. We await judgment. Um, and we, we don't know when that is, but irrespective of whether the court rules in our favour or doesn't rule in our favour, I think in our case, and you see it whenever there's tens of thousands of people in the streets of Belfast on the Time for Truth march. You see it whenever there are delegations going to Brussels. You see it when Relatives for Justice, the Pat Finucane Centre, or activists or journalists or politicians are going all around the world saying that this remains to be resolved. This must be resolved. If people here are serious about reconciliation, then the past is going to have to be dealt with as painfully, um, as painful as that may well be. And I think that means that this campaign isn't going away anywhere. Whilst I was a child, a baby, when my father was murdered, I'm older now, my brother, my sister, um, my children, and the children of so many other people in this room will continue to fight for truth and for justice for everybody else um, that, that this represents. Because it's something that we have always said from a very early stage. This system wasn't put in place to murder Pat Finucane. This system did murder Pat Finucan, but it murdered many other people as well, before he was killed and after he was killed. And the system is still in place, designed to cover up and frustrate families' attempts to get truth. But I, I, I'll finish on something that Joe said at the start, because whilst there were only literally only a handful of solicitors who did the type of work that my father did in the 80s, and you know, when I was eight years old, my father was 39, I'm 39 in a couple of weeks, and you realise 39 isn't that old, even though when you're younger you think it's the oldest number in the world. Um, but he had his best years ahead of him professionally, and I think it was a very deliberate decision to kill him to prevent and to silence other lawyers and solicitors from doing that type of work. And whilst I would never criticise lawyers who decided not to do that type of work, I think what you see now is a generation coming down with lawyers, people wanting to do law, people wanting to do human rights. And law isn't necessarily the answer. You know, people who are involved in Relatives for Justice, Pat Finucane Centre, people who are activists, people who want to make this place um, much, much better, who come from this community and want to give back to this community. For me, I, I think that is very much a legacy of Pat Finucane and what he stands for and what he represents. Um, and I think that gives me an enormous sense of pride that whilst they may have tried to silence him, I don't think they could have made a bigger mess of that if they tried, um, because we are still here today and the name reverberates uh, around the world. And I suppose the last thing that I want to finish on, which I've touched on as well, is that I think an enormous amount of credit for all of that has to go to my mother. Um, and the um, thank you. We're. We're a big family and we are lucky in that sometimes and whilst um, we can fall out and you can have your ups and downs, I think under my mother's leadership that where we are here today I think is nothing short of, of outstanding. And I don't just say that because it's our birthday today, but it is our birthday today. Um, so I'll finish on that. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, John. You'd have to follow that with a happy birthday. <laughs> Before I introduce our next speaker, can I take the opportunity on your behalf of thanking St. Mary's for hosting the event today. Very important. I also would like to thank Fela for the organizers. I would particularly like to thank the young volunteers of Fela, who you may have met on your way in. Some of them are on the left hand, my right hand side, who have been here from quite early today to get chairs out and help the staff and, and point the direction. These events, as you probably know, they don't just happen. They happen because they're made to happen. So on your behalf again, I want to thank Fela and St Mary's. Our, our next speaker really doesn't need any introduction, but I want to say, because sometimes in the, in the, the melee of all the stuff that we live in and we go through, He's also a survivor of the British death squads, at least on one occasion, and has been steadfast, steadfast in his opposition to the things that are required to end in this country and the things that are needed to be done. And I also have to say, a friend of Pat Finnegan's, Jerry Adams. Well, my name is Sagar Skor Magov, Goliar, Goramila Magad, Joe. I feel very humbled to follow John. We can't go on my August time. Alan the Rag, I'm so so. To Silicon Gawilshev, Comperjack. I got this. Magog Harja has August Makov Ron, the Nevenia. We said a Balia Clea and Yay. August uh, Tom Medjaldig, brother of us, John Common, John Fanukan, Neve Enya. When John used to play football, he played for uh, Neve Enya, who were out yesterday, and we're all very, very proud of that team from North Belfast. And Tommy, if we're quick to Geraldine, to John, to Michael, Catherine, Mark Jesh, a Gomsa, a Conscience Shaw, a new Libsha. August Mabwe has fostered the uh, Old Skull Waira, August Fela and Fubble. I want to thank Geraldine and John and Michael and Catherine and the entire Panookan family for the invitation to give the annual Pat Panookan Lecture. So I hope you're comfortable because I have a lot to say to put detail around what John very eloquently spelt out. I want to thank Fela and Fubble for organizing this event and St Mary's for facilitating it. And I'm hum humbled and honoured to have the opportunity to remember the work, the courage, and the leadership of Pat Finucane, a dedicated human rights lawyer. And while the focus of my remarks will be on Pat's work, we will also honour Pat the person, the Falls Road man, the son, the father, the brother, and the husband, the quirky, clever, good-natured friend and family member. Tuesday is the 30th anniversary of Pat's death at the hands of a British state-sponsored death squad. He was just 39 when he was murdered. Next month, March the 21st, would have been Pat's 70th birthday. And as a human rights lawyer, it didn't matter to Pat whether you were a Republican, a Unionist, a Loyalist, or none of these. If you were arrested, you have rights and Pat's responsibility, his vocation, his mission in life was to vindicate and defend these rights. Pat believed that the law should uphold and protect the rights of citizens. But he was not naive. He understood the difference between the theory and the practice and the application of human rights. That was part of his experience, part of his family's experience growing up in a sectarian orange state which didn't want them and which denied them and hundreds of thousands of others their right to fair employment and decent housing. Pat grew up the eldest of a family of eight in a working class nationalist clan in West Belfast. He and I went to the same school. St Finian's are both in a wall on the Falls Road, August Skullwira, Foster and St Mary's as well. 
I was a year ahead of him. As a student in the late 60s and early 70s, Pop was inspired by the civil rights struggle. The Battle of the Bog Side, the brutal response of the RUC and the British states, and the devastation caused by the pogroms of August 69 were also hugely influential on him. Be a howlock in a honey destroyed Percy, Egan Armstrong. The Finucane family lived in Percy Street, just across from St. Comgall School on the Falls Road at that time. They were one of the hundreds of families in Belfast forced from their homes in August 1969. And from all these experiences grew a determination and part to challenge these injustices. That meant being the best human rights lawyer he could be. He graduated from Trinity College in Dublin and set up practice in Belfast. It was in Trinity that he, he and Jardine met. He went on to be one of several lawyers who regularly worked with the Association of Legal Justice. The Association of Legal Justice was a voluntary organisation. It was established in 1970 to help the families of citizens being arrested every day by the RUC and the British Army. With little money and not a lot of legal expertise, Clara Riley, who's here today, Falsha Road, Clara. The late Leo Wilson, Anne Murray, Francis Murray, Father Brian Brady, and others worked day and night to provide support to desperate families. They were up against a British system that was constantly changing the rules of arrest, of interrogation, and detention to suit their own political agenda. Getting information from British Army bases, from RUC barracks, about citizens detained was no easy task. Without the support, and the assistance of Pat and other lawyers, the work of the ALJ would have been immeasurably more difficult. And looking back on it, these human rights defenders deserve our commendation and our thanks. August Tomwich, Aleg Buick, Debsha, Goldier. <laughs> the Finucane family endured much during this period. Pat's brother John, an IRA volunteer, was killed in a car accident in 1972. Another brother, Dermot, was imprisoned, and after escaping from Long Cash in 1983, he fought a successful extradition case. Seamus was interned at the age of 16 in 1973 also. He was later imprisoned in 1976 after being arrested with Bobby Sands. Be out in your Ogumsa, or Wahar Pat. Upper she lend a tehon and was first to hear a re I knew Pat's mother, Kathleen. Kathleen was a strong woman, widely liked and respected, good humoured and resilient. Her husband died after the family home in Lenadoon was raided in September 1978. And the more I reflect on those days, the more I am in awe of the women in our struggle, from all sides, all our mothers, my own mother, Pat's mother, Geraldine, the mother of John, Michael and Catherine. What they put up with while rearing their families is heroic. And sometimes we take our mummies for granted. As MacParish wrote, Lord, you are hard on mothers. We suffer in their coming and their going. Kathleen Finugan was such a mother. And on her hard time, as we have heard from John, Geraldine also has become an outstanding mother on her own and a heroic woman who deserves our gratitude and deep appreciation for her courage, her determination, her grace and her great humanity. Pat and Geraldine were married in 1972. I met Geraldine first when I called to see Pat in their flat in Lenadoon. He wasn't in. As usual, Geraldine might reflect. And that's when I first became aware of Pat's view of himself as a wonderful athlete. 
and the soccer star. And later I was to admire photographs of him kicking a ball. The photographs were in the toilet in their new home in North Belfast. During these turbulent years, Pat's reputation as a hard-working, conscientious, enthusiastic, successful and skillful lawyer were growing. Bishay we brew a goni, Akmar near Kyle a fe gran ariu. Despite all of the difficulties, he never lost his sense of humour, he never lost his quirkiness. He worked long demanding hours under trying and difficult conditions representing his clients. He was a lawyer working within a unionist and British dominated legal and judicial process in which torture, in which the beating of detainees was part and parcel of the system of arrest and interrogation. The conveyor belt system was perfected in the mid-1970s as part of Britain's criminalisation strategy. The Special Powers Act was replaced with, among other repressive laws, with the Prevention of Terrorism Act and the Emergency Provisions Act. Forced confessions, which were usually the only evidence presented, were readily accepted by non-jury diplock courts. Evidence of ill treatment in Castle Ray, Gough Barracks, the Strand Road and other torture centres was brushed aside, ignored, dismissed to facilitate the imprisonment of hundreds of men and women. By the way, in 1972, when I was arrested, I was one of those beaten repeatedly in Palace Barracks. And later in 1974, in Springfield Road Barracks, I was beaten unconscious again and again and again. And I tell you that just to personalise this. British Secretary of State Roy Mason the Chief Constable Ken Newman issued weekly statements boasting of the numbers arrested. Newman claimed that the prisoners were beating themselves up to discredit the IUC. And during this time, Pat defended many political prisoners. Later, during the hunger strikes, he went on to represent Bobby Sands and the women in Armagh and the fear pollute the blanket men's interests. And the little columns, the chock the, the chocks, that were written in cigarette papers, or bits of the Gideon Bible, and smuggled back and forth between the Fear Plude and the Sinn Féin POW department, Pat was known as the Signer. Shake. We're going to publish. After the that squad.
these wars. This this meant to And then flew. Turning an American more. And the other front of the legal. with union constable John Later, he 
is later in. Orange and the haunts the. Circle I don't see. Stop with them. Was on fire. person for Brown are I also
several weeks. John Stevens. commitment So what are the reasons? Through its country to Marek and Peltr Okay. The nineteen Cameron.
presents so called late Work our guidelines. The Sylvia. The involvement by the Just claimed. Very strong. happened to Pat and many others. This report is a sham. This report is a whitewash. This report is a confidence trick dressed up as an independent scrutiny and given the invisible clothes of reliability. But most of all, most hurtful and most insulting of all, this report is not the truth. Well said, Geraldine. <laughs> For almost 20 years, Pat Panookan battled every day in defence of the rights of his cl clients. And he did so in the face of an arsenal of repressive laws, as we have just outlined. And he did so against a system that does not believe that citizens have rights. 
It sees the law as just another weapon in its despicable campaigns. And today, the battle for the rights of citizens continues. The context, yes, is different. The rights issues may have changed. But the issue of rights for citizens, which was at the heart of Pat's efforts during his years as a human rights lawyer, is still as relevant today. These include prisoners' rights, there are other fundamental human rights available in every state on these islands except this one, which must be protected and advanced. These include marriage equality, Irish language legislation, women's reproductive rights, and legacy issues. And it's also true that the equality and parity of esteem components of the Good Friday Agreement have still not been implemented in full. There's a pressing need for a Bill of Rights as set out in the Good Friday Agreement and which has been resisted by successive British governments and by the Unionist parties. And that is not good enough. A Bill of Rights is essential for the protection of citizens' rights. And Professor Colin Harvey, in a submission to the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Justice and Equality on the issue of rights on a Bill of Rights, said just last month, it's apparent that aspects of the 1998 agreement around identity are not well understood and are not fully reflected in domestic law, policy and practice. And he called for a Charter of Rights for the island of Ireland, which is part of the Good Friday Agreement. In its submission to the Oireachtas Committee, the Committee on the Administration of Justice warned that Irish citizens in the North may be reduced to the status of second-class citizens after Brexit. The CHA pointed out that Irish citizens in the North will become EU citizens living, and I quote, in a non-member state, thus making their status constitutionally and practically uncertain and insecure. In December 2017, in the joint report produced by the European Union and the British government, paragraph 52 specifically stated that the people of the North who are Irish citizens will continue to enjoy rights as EU citizens, including where they reside in Northern Ireland. The Taoiseach stated at that time that everyone born in the North will continue to have the right to Irish and therefore EU citizenship. He also stated that the joint report was rock solid, cast iron and politically bulletproof. And in a response to a letter recently by representatives of civic nationalism, the Taoiseach assured them and us that the government had protected our interests. He said to all of us, your birthright as Irish citizens and therefore as EU citizens will be protected. He went on to tell us, you will never again be left behind by an Irish government. Now that was very welcome and a very positive commitment, but it has to be more than a clever soundbite. Many now believe that this promise, including me, has been broken. The specific commitment to citizens who reside in the North is missing from the withdrawal agreement published last November. And I've raised this many times in the doll, and the Taoiseach has yet to explain why the rock, solid, cast iron and politically bulletproof joint report commitment of December 2017 is missing. Last week the government in Dublin published its European Parliament elections bill legislating for the European elections which are due to take place in May. And the EU had allocated two additional seats to the Irish state. And Sinn Féin and others urged the Taoiseach to allocate these two seats to the north to ensure that citizens here who voted to remain would continue to be represented in the European Parliament. The government in Dublin said no. And we'll attempt to amend this, although I don't hold my breath, in committee. And on the back of very strong representation from Sinn Féin and others, the Irish government, in its lobby of our European neighbours on Brexit, rightly stressed and stresses the centrality of the Good Friday Agreement to the outcome of the Brexit negotiations. Yet, the Tanish and the Taoiseach repeatedly dismiss a part of that agreement. A referendum on Irish unity is a part of the Good Friday Agreement. It's a key provision and an integral part of that historic agreement. So the Irish government...
So the Irish government cannot cherry pick the Good Friday Agreement. The days when citizens here in the north, when Irish citizens here in the north, would meekly accept second class citizenship, they're gone. They're over. They're finished. And those days ended. Whatever had happened in his head, when the legs of Pat Van Nugan decided to make a stand. That's when it ended. It takes a bit of way to work these things out, but that's when it ended, when people decided to stand up. So we today, we have a continuum of struggle. And to achieve positive change and to defeat resistance to the absolutely correct demand for rights requires a constant need for vigilance and a long-headed view of the past and very, very especially of the future. Unity is strength. For example, whatever about our criticisms of the European Union, we can hardly imagine the European Union telling the British that they cannot leave the European Union. You couldn't imagine uh, the European Parliament telling the British that they're going to suppress the British Parliament. They're going to do away with the Parliament at Westminster. But that's what happened to us. When the people of Ireland voted to leave the British Empire, we were told you can't leave the British Empire. You have to stay in the British Empire. And when we elected the first Dáil 100 years ago, the British government suppressed it, outlawed it, and started a war. So I say all of that not for people in this room, but for the Taoiseach. That the Taoiseach needs to learn that it's not about Q Grant. That the Taoiseach needs to learn the lessons of history. The Taoiseach needs to know that the British government doesn't have friends. It has interests, and it always acts in its own interest. So the Taoiseach has to stand up to the Brits and stand by the Good Friday Agreement in all of its parts. It needs to have a consistent all-island vision. This is crucial. A consistent vision for the whole island of Ireland. It needs to have all-island objectives, because the Good Friday Agreement is an all-island agreement. In addition, he also has a responsibility, a constitutional responsibility, to promote the goal of Irish unity and to work to achieve it through democratic dialogue and negotiation. And we all know, we have all seen the threat that's posed to our rights and to our economies by the British, the English, Tories. So this issue of rights is as important today as it was in Pat Van Nuken's time. And whether we're party political or not, the demand of all progressive people must be for a citizen-centred society in which everyone is equal under the law and where the rights and their entitlements are protected in the law. And all of us need to be part of that effort. <coughs> we who are Republicans believe that this should include the basics of life that it should be economic, it should be political and social, the right to a home, the right to a job, to access to education, to universal health care, to a clean and safe environment, to a life free from sectarianism. But whatever about that, I don't believe we're going to be able to fully achieve these rights until we have control of our own affairs, free from British involvement. And the Good Friday Agreement does set out a peaceful and democratic way to achieve that. So we're calling on the, the Irish government to establish a forum to sign up for the referendum on Irish unity and on like Brexit to precede that with an informed and an inclusive debate. Shin Mamej, I just see, and you're always afraid to pick somebody out in case you miss somebody, but I just see PJ McGrory's daughter here, PJ was my lawyer for years, did an awful lot of terrific uh, work. I see Slainer's wife here. I see lots of other victims of, of the conflict. And you know, one of the things that I admire about the Finucans is that they 
in my opinion, I've never discussed this with any of them, are using the skills and the high profile that Pat had to help everybody else who doesn't have the same abilities. And <laughs> Geraldine has roared, uh, and where's John's children? He was only joking. <laughs> <laughs> There's Dermot too. Hey, Dermot. Jardine has reared as a single parent, as a widow, a wonderful family. In the face of British government intransigence, the abject failure of successive Irish governments, it's truly inspirational to know these people. And I've repeatedly asked successive Tishik, we see at the moment how we can use our diplomatic abilities in our common good, however that turns out is another story. But I've repeatedly asked the te successive teachings, going right back to Bertie O'Hearn, to undertake an international campaign in which all of the Irish diplomatic services are unlisted to expose British publicity and to demand the inquiry that the Finucane family were promised. And to their shame, so far, they have refused. Yes, the Taoiseach may raise it. Yes, in an occasional conversation on the margins of a, a meeting. But there's been no consistent, no planned, no strategic programme of work to mobilise international and diplomatic support for the public inquiry into Pat Van Nuken's murder. And that also is not good enough. It's a very reasonable demand. I want to wish Geraldine and her children and grandchildren well in these difficult times and you know I believe that you can rely on all of us throughout of all and you know also that there are people here in this country and in Britain and in the USA who have supported you for the last 30 years and will continue to do so and that will be true when the British Supreme Court gives its judgment which is due to do in the next short while. Pat was a decent human being he dedicated his life to helping others. He was a family man. He loved Geraldine. He loved his three children. He loved his siblings. And in places where rights were constantly denied, Pat was a fighter for rights. Balik, eh. He didn't need to do it. He didn't need to do what he did. Many of us, and I include myself in this, benefited from his bravery and his expertise. He was a hero. And to today, the defence of human rights is important as ever. In our own place, in Gaza, in Africa, in Latin America, in other places. And, you know, just as I conclude, why does the British establishment go to such lengths to cover up its misdeeds? You ever wonder about that? Is it arrogance? Is it imperial values, they think they still have an empire, we're it. <laughs> Is it racism? <laughs> Is, it, Is it some sort of superiority complex? Well, it's all of these, and it's more. But it also needs to protect its agents and its operatives, because be sure the British and their allies use the same strategies in other theatres of war at this time, in Iraq, in Libya, in Afghanistan, wherever the British establishment engages in military operations, these methods are still being used, and the British establishment has a need to protect those who act on their behalf. So, there are also human rights defenders, lawyers, trade unionists, journalists, farmers, community voluntary activists throughout the world defending the rights of citizens. And it's important in this global battle for human rights that we all remember Pat Finucane. His life, his death are proof that one person, even at a huge cost for him and his family, that one person can make a difference and we salute him for making a difference for us.
to finish on it, it probably isn't appropriate, but I get into this mode, Richard McCauley always looks at me disapprovingly. But since I stood down as Oakthorne Sinn Féin, I've been taken to singing at public events. <laughs> and I'm open for weddings, I've just been mostly at demonstrations, so it is Geraldine's birthday, so. La Brahona Ditch, La Brahona Ditch. La Braha Hona did. Happy birthday to you. Thanks, Jordan. Good morning. I too have a confession, I've taken the singing as well, but I think I'll keep mine for the shower. Our final speaker is probably unknown. Um, her name is known to us all, but her, but her persona is not known. She's very quiet. She's not like her brother, six foot two and a half tall. She's made of steel. Believe you me. Believe you me. And this family has been the scaffolding bars around the campaign for justice, for those who have no voice. And she has been an integral part of it. She's not a public speaker, and she's a wee bit nervous, but not too nervous. So will you give her a warm welcome, Catherine. <laughs> Catherine Finucan. I also wish to thank each and every one of you for coming here today to show your support and to Fela and Fobel for organising. It is both humbling and overwhelming and my family truly appreciate it. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross said, the reality is you will grieve forever. You will not get over the loss of a loved one you will learn to live with it. You will heal and you will rebuild yourself around the loss you have suffered. You will be whole again, but you will never be the same again. Nor should you be the same, nor should you want to. Losing my father in the brutal way that we did added another dimension to our grief. Its public nature means we grieve along with our society. It has not been resolved and the consequences are many. Whilst we take comfort and strength from the support we are offered, those who choose to deny us truth and justice compound our grief, move on, draw a line under the past, you're asking for too much. When my young daughter asks me, how did Grandpa Pat die? I am reminded that the past is now moving into yet another generation. Now, eight years old, she asks me, Mummy, what would Grandpa Pat have thought of me? Tell me what he was like. It wasn't only my brothers and me who had their father stolen from them, but our children too. So, I tell my daughter what her granda was like. He liked to play football and didn't like to lose. He liked to joke and a laugh and often played practical jokes on his siblings. He inspired me to learn the French language as I listened to him asking for directions on our family holidays in France. And I tell her, he would have loved her very much and they would have had the best of fun together. My dad, in his work as a solicitor, was an advocate for the community. 
My brothers continue that work and my role in mental health is a branch of that work. We are of him and he has inspired us to be who we are. We did not have him for long in our lives and although we have our memories, we were robbed of so many more. We keep my dad alive because we carry him in us. We not only fight for justice for him, but for a future fit for our children and one that he would be proud of. Tonight at 7 o'clock at Lansdowne Drive, Relatives for Justice will hold a vigil in Pat's memory. So if you're free and you can go, please do go. Please remember him that way. There's been a lot of personal stuff said today and I would like just to add to it. In the hours following Pat's death, many of us who were his friends travelled to the house to both help the family and particularly comfort the family. And we were very, made very welcome, and we were very well treated. Our intentions were that we would provide some comfort to the young children uh, Jerry had been wounded. And in fact, in my own experience, I, I cried uncontrollably, and the comfort that was given was given to me. And I cried, I would like to say, but it wouldn't be true, for the loss to the Finucans. I cried for my loss, and I suspect today I cried for your loss. So today as we finish, I would like us in a small way, a tiny way, to offer our comfort to the Finucan family. So from us to you, we're together and we're going forward. Got to be the and thank you all.